Um, good morning, my dear friends. Today we are very glad to have with us Anna Bando, a doctor who completed her medical studies at the University Josip Juraj Trosmer in Osijek, Croatia. She is a winner of a number of state and regional scholarships and the winner of several regional literacy competencies. And I will talk today on polio eradication movement and road to the global peace. Anna, what is yours? Uh, thank you for this introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say I feel very privileged to be here. Uh, whose main focus of study is not in the social sciences, but it's really been a valuable experience and eye-opening experience. I feel very lucky to have been able to meet you, to learn from you, and to learn with you. Um, now, we have been discussing many views of peace in the past few days, and I would like to offer you my perspective. Because when I think about peace, I think about health and how interconnected they are. In words of Director General of World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, there cannot be peace without health and there cannot be health without peace. Global peace is the concept of uh, progress, stability and freedom, not simply absence of war. We have. Um, as well as health is this unity of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not simply absence of disease. Peace and health complement each other, and they are dependent on each other. And most importantly, disruption of one means disruption of other. There have been many recent threats to global health and global peace, one of them being COVID-19 pandemic and an ever-present anti-vax movement. The topic of vaccination has been filled with uh, conspiracies, controversy, misinformations, and hearsays. And when in fear, people die. And it is one of the primary roles of academic community to fight those fears with knowledge. Um, therefore, I decided to tell you about polio education movement um, and what it has done for global peace and global health, and just how dangerous could it be if the anti-vax movement strikes for polio vaccine. Um, so to begin with, uh, poliovirus is an enterovirus within the Bucornaviride family and it causes a highly infectious disease. It is estimated at 1 in 200 infections and irreversible paralysis with 5 to 10 percent of those affected dying from immobilized respiratory muscles. Uh, this is the world map of polio in 1988 and thanks to the immense efforts, the only two countries that are believed to have never reached polio-free status are Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, when we talk about history of polio and polio vaccine, we need to mention the time between the years 1948 and 1955. At this time, multiple outbreaks of polio occurred, and this frightened the citizens of the world. Um, they started to boycott public gatherings and limit social contact between children, because uh, children under the age of five are the most vulnerable group for attracting polio. Um, and this was a time when disruption of health meant disruption of peace. Uh, and it was obvious there was a form of prevention needed. So Salk invented uh, the inactivated vaccine in 1954 and Sabin invented oral polio vaccine in 1960. Uh, virtually all countries that have eradicated polio use oral polio vaccine um, for many reasons, one of them being that it causes good mucosal immunity and it's good to stop transfer from person to person. Uh, but also it is very useful in mass vaccination campaigns as it doesn't require medical health professionals and sterile needle syringes. It is our goal to move to inactivated polio vaccine once the world reaches polio-free status uh, to have less vaccine-induced cases of polio. Uh, one of the main factors in eradicating polio has been the Rotary International. They have uh, implemented their Polio Plus program in 1985. Uh, today, this movement is better known as Ant Polio Now. And over the years, Rotary has donated more than $2 billion and countless volunteer hours in effort to help vaccinate more than 3 billion children in 122 countries. Our first vaccination project was implemented in 1979 in the Philippines 
This is a five-year commitment to vaccination of six million children. And this project was very successful. Uh, the communication between the government and Rotary volunteers has been done very well. And therefore, they made similar promises to people of Bolivia, Cambodia, Haiti, Morocco, and Sierra Leone. Um, in 1988, World Health Assembly was held in Geneva, and Rotary pushed a strong argument to make a global solution to the question of polio. And this ended up creating Global Polio Eradication Initiative, thanks to which polio has been reduced by 99.9% .9 since the 1980s. Another strong partner in polio eradication has been the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They have been partnered to Rotary since 2002 in this fight, and they have been matching $2 to every dollar Rotary raises for polio. Now, the most important thing we need to talk about are new challenges or main challenges of polio eradication. One being providing vaccine to the remote areas with sparse population and countries at war. Second being how to maintain a polio-free status and uh, the third, the uprise of anti-vax movement. Now, conflict, political instability, hard to reach population and poor infrastructure continue to pose challenges in eradication of polio. Each country has a unique set of challenges that require communication, dialogue, that require patience and dedication, and most importantly, strong public health campaigns modeled for its target audience. It is a worldwide problem that requires local solutions. We need to have more interaction between scientists and practitioners who are in touch with their communities, who, knows, who know what their struggles are, what their doubts are, what their fears are, and we need to address them in the kind of language they can understand in order to build trust and relationship with these communities in a more organic, sustainable way. Um, another thing is that when a country reaches a polio free status, it is not a given that it will keep it. It was only a few weeks ago there was a case of polio confirmed in New York State. And there hasn't been a case of polio in the US in almost a decade. Um, and this actually doesn't put America, this polio free status, in question uh, because this is an isolated case and it was uh, probably originated outside of the US. But it originated in an unvaccinated individual who happens to be a resident of New York State. Uh, there were also other outbreaks during the years in countries that are considered to be polio-free. There was one in Syria in 2017, in 2018, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and more recently in Malawi and Mozambique. Uh, one of the most recent threats was in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, this situation was made worse by the Russian aggression in Ukraine, by the COVID-19 pandemic, and also by internal uh, health reforms that they were going through at a time. Uh, and since January 2022, there have been 19 confirmed cases of paralytic polio in Western Ukraine. And even called for a public health emergency in two of the provinces in Western Ukraine. The scientists of American Society for Microbiology said that the invasion of the Russian Federation into Ukraine on February 24, 2022, led to thousands of victims, occupied territories, millions of refugees, and internally displaced persons. All this disrupted access to medical care, significantly disrupted routine vaccinations, and the response to the polio outbreak in Ukraine. It was a time when disruption of peace meant disruption of health. And the Ministry of Health of Ukraine has contacted um, international sources to have a unified strategy to fight this polio outbreak, because if Ukraine's polio free status is a question, so is Europe's. Um, and then again, last challenge is how to fight the anti-vax movement and the strong influence of social media and the way we perceive modern medicine. Um, vaccine deniers and vaccine skeptics have always existed, as long as the vaccine itself. But it was an um, article by Andrew Wakefield that was later rejected, uh, in which he made a connection between autism and MMR vaccine from mumps, uh, rubella and uh, measles that really kind of gave the momentum to the anti-vax movement. And then again, with the COVID-19 pandemic and fast vaccine development, people started to question its safety, its efficiency, and even intentions behind creating this vaccine. If we enter the pre-vaccine era, the consequences could be really devastating to health systems, 
all around the world, it would be also an economic burden and it would negatively impact social domains. Um, now, uh, academic community has the most important tool of education. We need to create leaders and diplomats, we need people who would offer to communicate and to have a dialogue between governments, organizations, and general public. We need someone who would cross the bridge between science, someone who would listen to practitioners who knows what these struggles are, and obviously we need to build uh, communities and we need to help uh, educate people to be critically thinking and to promote evidence-based medicine. In conclusion, uh, polio eradication movement has been an invaluable experience and what it means to eradicate an illness in a modern day era. And with polio eradication just at our fingertips, we are left with some questions. Like what is next? What illness could we possibly eradicate next with the means and the knowledge we are left with after polio? And is even eradication of illness the right path? Maybe we need to focus on raising health standards around the world, or sanitary standards for that matter. Uh, we are also left with questions of universal health and global health and how connected medical professionals are, how often and accurate do they report these infectious diseases and do we have the whole picture, do we have the right picture. Uh, polio has taught us that we could set timelines, but only with patients and educations we can reach our goals. And polio education is actually a pathway under road to global peace, a part of the puzzle. And with the way we have been raising means and volunteers, um, I think it's safe to say that we are headed in the right direction. So thank you for your attention. And I am I'm very, very grateful to you, and I think I, I speak for many here, because you sort of brought us back to the basics. The problem with the problem with uh, social sciences is that, I guess the microphone is not working, but... <laughs> 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 Okay. The problem with um, conferences where you have a lot of social scientists is that we tend to get way beyond the, the real life, discussing if you know modern neuroscience proved if that Kant was wrong or, or not. Um, what you reminded us of was that in order to have peace, people need to have water, food, shelter, and health, and with the changing environment in the world with climate change, with anti-vax movement, with many countries regressing in standards that have already reached, uh, peace is also in, in, in danger on that level. And we need to think about how to get those things back. And so I've noticed um, many questions already, but let me um, ask you one since I have the microphone. Um, would you say that the anti-vax movement then in the context of this conference really is um, a, a potential threat to, um, well, not, if not world peace, but a potential threat to the, the preconditions that we need to have in order to have world peace. Uh, people being healthy and not being extremely poor and not, being, not having uh, epidemics and pandemics of, of different diseases. And would you then also say, agree that the medical universities and the medical schools could um, have a great contribution to world peace by promoting more actively than they are now the you know the the the, the fundamental um, conclusions of modern science that have brought us to where we are now, and that many are now putting on the question. I think 
that anti-vax movement is extremely dangerous to our peace and global peace um, because often these um, individuals or groups of individuals are very unhappy with the way um, modern medicine is operating and it's one thing when they're unhappy with the vaccines which is a problem for itself because many infectious diseases that are possibly fatal have been eradicated from the face of earth and now could come back due to lack of immunization in the communities but another reason is that they um, are not always peaceful and not always using only verbal arguments um, to achieve their goals and medical universities should definitely do more on their part in promotion of health. My university doesn't really work on that, uh, they more rely on the hospital itself and I think academic community could have a really strong influence um, during the whole COVID pandemic, we maybe had a few lectures here and there about uh, the topic of vaccination and how to promote that. And I think that wasn't enough and students could really get involved um, in that promotion process. I, sorry, I, I have <laughs> that are related to some so I, I have two questions related to, to health. Um, one is related to globalization. Uh, to the globalization, because you said, for instance, that um, <clears throat> there was a case of polio in, uh, in the States recently. Um, we in Spain, we had a case of, well, several cases of TB. And uh, <clears throat> several cases as well of meningitis uh, recently, uh, even though it was eradicated uh, for decades. And this was also for people that were coming like uh, immigrants, again, something that you know tended to stigmatize again immigrants. Um, and, <clears throat> and then the, the, the question is that this is why it's so important to have this kind of global programs because when we have some cases in some countries, we speak because people are so mobile, actually it doesn't matter if your country, we know now with the COVID very for sure, that you cannot, you know, protect your country alone, so it doesn't work with health, it doesn't work with diseases, we really have to do this kind of global problems. And I wanted to ask, uh, how do you think that this kind of mobility, increased mobility, um, in, in uh, also related with the COVID, with all, not all countries are like clean right now, how this might uh, impact um, Peace, but also of course the widespread of diseases. This would be the first question. And the second question is <clears throat> related like to the politicization of health as well, and uh, especially to the politicization of the vaccine of the COVID. Um, in, in Israel, for instance, everyone that was there, <clears throat> we were vaccinated only with Pfizer because they had a contract with Pfizer. This is something we knew after. So we were something like labor, I mean, lab rats from Pfizer. We were the first vaccinated, we all have four shots and we glow in the darkness. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something like this. But Palestinians, for instance, they didn't want the Pfizer because it was the American vaccine. And they were vaccinated later because they were waiting for the Russian vaccine or even for the Chinese. And they were very sad because they could not have the Cuban vaccine. So I find it very strange because for me a vaccine is a vaccine, but this labeling, especially for the COVID vaccine, I found it like uh, this way of politicizing and putting political labels to vaccines, I found it <clears throat> like, I don't know, very strange. And I don't know if, if you think that this is also, um, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Like, For the first question, I think that the world is so fast-paced and we are traveling everywhere and it's, um, it's not possible to um, stop people from moving and to keep until one country is COVID-free because uh, we tried that and it didn't work and it caused a lot of negativity among uh, the communities and among nations. Uh, so we had to open up the world and uh, yes, it's true, but the only thing we can do is try to implement these global programs that are focused on some local solutions because it's not the same, not every country is going to respond to the same things in the good way. It's not everyone's approach to uh, implementation of the vaccine, for instance, COVID, um, that path is not going to be the same and we really need to listen what the situation is in certain country um, and use that to our advantage. So I think, yes, uh, think globally, act locally, 
would be the answer here. And um, uh, for the second question, um, I think it's very dangerous when politics, when medical conditions are made a political statement. And here uh, we were often witness that some radicals were like, no, we're not going to wear masks, we're not going to get vac vaccinated as a political statement. Um, and to refuse a vaccine that is available to make a political statement, I don't think it's a um, very smart thing to do in the time we were in at the moment and just how uh, spread the COVID was and how dangerous the epidemic was. Thank you for this well-rounded and wonderful talk, really important topics. And I just have a couple of comments. Maybe these uh, eradication efforts could be also seen in a way as promoting this positive peace. We also have some examples. Uh, for example, Croatia just recently became a radius free country. That was a centenarian dream. And after 100 years, we joined a lot of nations in the European Union. So this was also something we can do as promoting positive peace. But among these challenges of vaccination, in eradication efforts in vaccination in general, maybe we should remind ourselves that uh, when CIA was trying to track down Osama bin Laden, they were using hepatitis B vaccination efforts to also take samples of DNA, and that's how they found them, but that eroded really a trust in Pakistan to vaccinations. And here we have a result, you also highlighted Pakistan as one of the countries. So we should be very cognizant not to mix these political goals and causes with uh, really important public health laws if our overall goal or our goal is to eradicate, eradicate some, some diseases. And also we have seen and witnessed how even these new infectious diseases like COVID-19 was used to polarize uh, and create tensions between countries when, for example, Vice President Trump called uh, SARS-CoV-2 like Chinese virus and repeatedly uh, uh, emphasizing that. So I think the field of infectious diseases and medicine in general can be used to polarize uh, and organize with countries. And this is something where we should be very, very cognizant as a medical community and also social community. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go on. If there are any other questions or comments? First of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, for me, it's actually really interesting to see that you uh, give a lecture on the Rotary, and you give a lecture on polio. Polio is one of uh, the most important topics inside the Rotary community. Um, and I think it's always important for any organization such as Rotary, um, humanitarian aid organization, to be concentrated on one topic. Uh, and now we have in the Rotary community very big discussion. Uh, do we need to work in the future in polio as well? Or we should be concentrate on other topics? Because somehow we solve the situation with polio. And what should be the next topics? And probably one of the next topics uh, or topic would be uh, water issue. What do you think about us? Uh, is it the right moment to somehow to switch uh, the rotary energy in another direction? Or do you think uh, they have to be concentrated much more in polio to really to, to map, to do the full success? The road to polio eradication is not done, um, and it might not be done in, in a while, and that not might be the bad thing, because pushing this goal just to say that we reached this goal is 
not really what we want. If we can say the world is polio free in 10, 20 or 100 years time, then we didn't really eradicate polio. So I think Rotary's efforts in the next decade probably should still stay here uh, because that was one of their uh, really important uh, initiatives. Uh, but obviously there are many health problems around the world to attack and there are also different things in other social domains that Rotary could um, give their energy to like water situations, health standards and sanitary standards, especially in developing countries. And they have proven that they have the means and that they are very good at being mediators between governments and between organizations. So that's definitely something valuable to use. And as health professionals, we should definitely cooperate with them on that. Because you know, it reminded me of something when when we talk about, for instance, human rights and and human you know civic rights and civic liberties. It's always a, we always say that you need every morning when you wake up you need to fight for them again. Uh, and if you think that you know you've got what you've got, you're very wrong, and you're on the on the good way of losing it. Um, is it the same with, with would it be the same principle with things like polio? So if we stop working on it it's going to come back. So we need to work on, on eradicating polio continuously or otherwise it will come back. Or not. Um, yeah, I think maybe not as strong as we work to eradicate an illness. So once it's eradicated, it's important to remember why that was needed in the first place. Um, there cannot be like an end to public health campaigns in terms of vaccin vaccinations uh, because obviously uh, the anti-vax movement is strong and there will probably be other vaccines they will um, like bleed. Um, so yeah, the struggle continues and maybe not as strong, but if we put that aside and forget about that, um, that could be very bad. <coughs> I just have a comment on what the Anubhi just said because uh, during the COVID period, um, and, and, and it's not only related to polio, but in general related to health, and this is that we cannot, I mean, we have reached uh, great uh, uh, standard levels in, uh, in health in Europe, yeah, um, but we cannot stop investing on them. And I think during the COVID period, at least in Germany and Spain, we have realized that in the, we have great standards, but in the last five years, six years, we have been de-investing. Yeah? And this is something that we didn't perceive as, uh, you know, as citizens. You went, you went to get an appointment, you went to the doctor, you didn't have to wait three months, you got an appointment, you went to the hospital. But when things got really critical, then is when everything exploded. When, for instance, in Germany, uh, there was Germany has a system, well, it's not a great system, but it's a system, it's a good system, a functioning system, and in Spain the same. So it's when we started see, seeing the holes that uh, we have not seen before. So I, I think states should not, should take health really very seriously, and even though we don't have COVID every day, and if we just have the COVID and we pass the COVID and we think, yeah, and we have made it and it's fine, and then this can happen again and again, and we should never stop uh, investing uh, in health, in all countries, in a very uh, simple way. I mean, you know, like uh, with a trying to to make some savings in in areas where, um, yeah, you never know, and we know now that we never know when we will need them again. So this is, I think, this is a, not only a question for polio, not only a question for I don't know any countries very far away, but for us ourselves in Europe. So I suppose we learn from that. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, um, that is very important to continue 
always work on public health especially and um, also as Dr. Mestrovich mentioned, uh, ethical questions in medicine are always a problem and keeping integrity as medical professionals and keeping away from politics as much as possible is also uh, one of the struggles of a modern day doctors and we can't really function in a society without taking into account uh, that political parties have a lot of say in how um, laws are going to go and um, they could limit the way we work even in public com campaigns. Uh, thank you, Diana. Thank you for your lecture and thank you for this uh, very great discussion. Uh, it is uh, amazing that uh, so many participants have actually interest in this topic and I'm sure that we can continue this uh, discussion later in the garden. Uh, thank you uh, once again for uh, talk on this very important topic on Rotary community and the polio. Thank you for that. And now we are with the next speaker. I'm very glad that I'm actually very happy uh, to have with us Professor Yurur Pinar, uh, Mugla City Kochban University, Turkey. Uh, she is an expert in political science and international relations with a focus on the Balkan countries. She published and edited lots of academic articles and books and received different awards and fellowships. She will talk today on the effect of the EU soft power policies in the Western Balkans on the regional peace and Turkey role in it. Pinar, floor is yours. Welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bando. Uh, uh, how is your my voice? Your voice is, your voice is perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Valla uh, Lepo, Pozdrav is Mola is Turske. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Professor Bando, for making this connection uh, and all contributors. Uh, I send my greetings and love to all participants from Mugla, the uh, southwestern coastal city of Turkey. Um, my title is The Positive Impact of Soft Power Policies in the Western Balkans and the Policies of EU and Turkey in this context. Uh, firstly, uh, sorry, I think it's okay. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to mention about the definitions and geopolitical importance of the Western Balkans shortly. Uh, the Western Balkans are at the heart of Europe, geographically surrounded by EU member states. Uh, Western Balkan is the term used in the European Union to refer to six countries in the southern and eastern Europe that are covered by EU enlargement policy. The Republic of Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Montenegro, Republic of Kosovo, Republic of North Macedonia and Republic of Serbia. The fact that it's an important corridor for energy transfer in terms of international balances and is in the region where trade road interest uh, increases the geopolitical importance of the Western Balkans. Uh, it is the most important desire of all the people of the region not to return to the war environment experiences in the 19th, when the security of Europe was in the great danger. The guns fell silent in the region, but the peace building efforts in the region have not yet reached in the desired Goals. Uh, shortly outline my uh, presentation. Uh, then, soft power in international relations, use soft power in the Western Balkans, and Turkey's partnership on regional peace. Uh, you know that uh, the, the uh, firstly uh, I mentioned about the main points of this study uh, before the uh, continued presentation. Turkey and you. 
which are close neighbors and attach uh, great importance to the stability of the region, are among the most important soft power actors in the region. You seeing Turkey as a partner country in solving the problems of the Western Balkans and producing more projects together will contribute to increase the dialogue between the countries of the region and building regional peace. Uh, then uh, the soft power of uh, power of attraction means that uh, we, we know that in the classical sense, power is defined as making an action that would not be done otherwise and is considered a means of coercion. Contrary to the classical definition, there is no coercion in soft power. It does not mean that the other party is forced to do some things, but that he wants to do something voluntarily. In this context, since soft power does not contain the element of coercion, it is not actually a power, but rather an attraction. Uh, soft power is able to cooperate rather than coerce, of course. Uh, uh, you is the actor that has made the biggest contribution to the recovery and the democratization of the region by promoting many projects for the region. The most important actor with the soft power over the uh, Balkan geography is the European Union. Since 2000, the EU's main soft power instrument in the region has been the membership perspective and roadmap. Uh, EU's enlargement policy and Balkan countries turning away from the reality of conflicts and turning their face towards their neighbors and especially the EU, there has been a rapprochement of the EU through public diplomacy towards the region. The main soft power tools applied by EU in the region are democracy and human rights practices. The attractiveness point, which is already the basis of the soft power, naturally exists in the EU's existence due to the values it defends, such as EU's culture, economy, rule of law, and human rights, and its aim to separate them all the region. Uh, the fact that EU does not have a military power and sanction mechanism like the UN has required it to give more important soft power elements. In uh, 2003, at the Thessaloniki summit, the EU leaders promised the Western Balkan countries that their future would be in EU. Even then, this commitment had a geopolitical dimension. Uh, the Western Balkans would soon after the ac accession of the Central and Eastern European countries form an enclave with EU territory and seemed logical that over time this region too, too should be included in European integration. Also, the prospect of joining the EU was the widely perceived as the best method to help these countries to overcome the heavy legacy of the wars of the 19th and to ensure lasting peace and stability. Uh, the EU also provides Western Balkans partners with political, financial, technical, education, uh, lots of times. However, in recent years, the EU has the experience in several uh, successive challenges, which according to the sum has to led to the decline in the blocked soft power. To name a few, the EU has experiences in the 2011 uh, Eurozone crisis, 2015 Greek government debt and refugee crisis, the 2016 Brexit, and some systematic crises such as the North-South divide and the rise of the far-left far-right parties and populist regimes. In addition, the use of the veto cards by some member states for the years with special demands for candidate countries and EU structures inability to prevent discourses, discontent, discontent in the Western Balkans. While most of the region's citizens still support EU members, doubts about its realization are growing, making it easier for anti-EU politicians. Uh, 
Uh, Europe is a continent which is not only the ge geographically determined space, but it's embedded in cultural, economic and political relations. This reality is that although they are not officially member of the EU, the Western Balkan states are part of the Euro and connection between states and people do exist. Globalization means that Western Balkan countries are pushed to find the trustworthy and supportive partner to be able to complete the economically. The EU, due to its proximity, the most obvious and the most logical partner. Uh, the second uh, important uh, soft power actor in the Western Balkans, also Turkey, uh, the Turkey's partnership uh, on regional peace is important. All uh, the the other actors and for the European Union, the Balkans has an important place in the foreign policy of the Republic of Turkey since its establishment. This region is a priority for Turkey, not only from a political, economical, geographical, geographical perspective, but also due to its historical, cultural and human ties with the region. With the disintegration of Yugoslavia, all the balances in the Balkans were altered and instability that arose from this process reached the level that threatened international peace. In the 19th, the Balkans had to live through destructive wars and ethnic cleansing. In these difficult times, Turkey has always acted in a harmony with Europe in all kinds of conflicts experiences by the region and has shown an example of full support and cooperation, both military and diplomatically. Uh, Turkey also contributed to ending the conflicts between Bosniaks and Bosnian Croats in 1990-30. In particular, friendly relations were established between the president of Turkey at the same time, Suleyman Demirel, and the Croatian colleges, Franja Tuzman. Turkey did not remain silent to massacre in the wars in Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo and participated in the solution process by supporting NATO and United Nations operations. When the ethnic conflicts took place in North Macedonia in 2001, Turkey took a stance that supported the territory integrity of this country. Soft power diplomacy is one of the most essential instruments used by Turkey in the Western Balkans since 2000s. In this context, Turkey is in a close dialogue with candidates and potential candidate countries like itself. It has not had a serious problem with any of these countries. Turkey has not taken a stand in the direction of only one of the Western Balkan countries that have conflicts between them and has always approached the region with integrative policies. Uh, uh, especially in 2000, Turkey has established various institutions in order to carry out soft power and public diplomacy activities more easily and systematically. These are the different uh, name of the different institutions uh, related for the soft power in the region. Uh, Turkey took initiative to solve the political problems and improve cooperation with the diplomatic initiatives in 2009, between uh, 2010, uh, when it was the term chairman of the Southeastern European cooperation process. The most important initiative among these was the tripartite Balkan summit meetings, uh, which were held to offer a better future for Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, this mechanism was established between Turkey, Bosnia Herzegovina, Serbia, and the second Turkey, Bosnia Herzegovina, Croatia, with Turkey's initiative. The international community appreciated Turkey's efforts. A similar approach coincides with the attitude of the European Union. In this crisis environment, uh, in this in, in the crisis environment created by the separatist statements of Republika Srpska in November 2021 uh, last year, Turkey continued the intensive diplomatic traffic. Miloran Dodik, who is the Serb member of the Bosnia Herzegovina Presidential Council, stated that the support of the President of Turkey 
Serbia and to Croatia is necessary for the dialogue of the local policy politicians in the Bosnia Herzegovina. After the Balkan started to warm up again, the Turkish foreign minister planned the regional visit in June uh, this year and visited Serbia, Croatia, North Macedonia, Bosnia Herzegovina, and Kosovo, giving a message for contribution to the regional peace, St stating that he will not allow the region to return to dark days of the 19th. The foreign minister underlined Ankara's support for the stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Some day, you, uh, same day, EU uh, Commission invited Prime Minister Vuc uh, uh, President Vucic and Kurti to Brussels to try to moderate their dialogue on the EU's platform. Uh, all these examples shows that the EU and the Turkey's vis vision for lasting stability in the region are similar. Uh, especially nowadays, after the Rus Russian war with Ukraine, the security and stability of the Western Balkans begin to discuss more. Russia maintains strong relations in particular with Serbia and Republic of Srpska and uses its influence often to the obstruct the EU's objectives. In addition, the rapid candidacy of the Ukraine and Moldova may lead, lead to the loss of the motivation in other candidate countries that have long struggled to carry out reforms. To prevent this, the EU should exhibit more protective and embracing policies and consider the region as a whole. The danger of uns unsustainable peace in the region will attract Russia to the region more. China is also increasing the investment in the region day by day, and therefore the EU's position as the main actor in the region may be endangered. Uh, loss of the motivation to integrate with Europe could pave the way for a re-establishment of ultranationalism in the Western Balkans. The historic, historical process show us the soft power policies are more effective than hard power elements in the Western Balkans. The fact that Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo have not yet fully stabilized in, in, uh, is an indication of this. Whenever the European Union shifts its agenda from the Western Balkans to a different region, reforms slow down, ethnic rhetoric rises and tensions rise. In this context, while using its soft power, uh, it would be the realistic approach for the EU to act to join the, with the experienced and the familiar neighbor Turkey, which has historical and social cultural ties with the region. Behind the lasting regional peace should be more intensive cooperation initiatives. The parties must believe and trust each other because we are team. Our goal is the region is common. Peaceful coexistence and lasting stability of all ethnic, religious or cultural groups. Whenever Turkey and its e European neighbors come together for a common goal, we can see that a strong synergy and the new areas of cooperation are created in the region. In this context, Turkey is the most important external stakeholder in the EU's peace projects in the Western Balkans. Together, the EU and Turkey should be willing to implement new projects to promote mutual respect and peaceful coexistence in the region. Working for a common goal can bring both sides more together. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you uh, again, everyone who contributed to the organization of the meeting. I hope to meet again at such meetings. Hvala svima koji su dobrinjeli ovoj vajnoj konferenciji. Hvala za lijepo. Um, professor, thank you very much for your very interesting um, perspective and very interesting ideas that you share with us. Um, before we open the discussion um, about just a small interesting detail about the role of Turkey in our region. Two and a half years ago and then two years ago we had terrible earthquakes in Croatia and uh, Turkey sent 200 
uh, housing containers as help to people who lost their homes. And these housing containers that Turkey sent were in place before, before the housing containers from the Croatian commodity reserves. So Turkey was not only helping, but it was really fast and really efficient. So let's hope that also that this is also some sort of a, a pointer and symbol of, of the future relations of Turkey and, and our region. And we have a question here from the from the participants. I have a question, may I ask? Okay. Okay. Uh, can I say uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation on, on this, uh, for me at least, a very, very important and uh, interesting topic. I wanted to ask you um, about the support uh, in public on the uh, EU membership in Turkey. Um, has it waned uh, with this very long, long process for Turkey or is it somehow remained stable? What is what is the status now? And um, a second question I wanted to ask you is, um, what do you think about the uh, EU soft power uh, when it comes to human rights in the countries that are not uh, in the process of the negotiations uh, with the EU? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, yes, uh, Turkey is the uh, most uh, Turkey is the oldest candidate of the uh, European Union. The negotiations uh, started uh, with the same time uh, with Croatia. Uh, it's continue, uh, but uh, some chronical problems uh, with uh, the some other. Uh, the uh, member of the old member of the European Union. Uh, you know, uh, of course, you uh, know that we have uh, some problems with uh, our uh, important neighbor, uh, Greece, from the old times uh, on the uh, some uh, sea, some uh, the uh, continental issues. Uh, as you know, that uh, the the uh, the uh, lots of. Uh, uh, the lots of uh, the other uh, members uh, of the uh, U U European Union uh, candidate of Europe has a uh, border and different kinds of uh, problems. Uh, sometimes in, in the, they uh, live. The Croatia also live with uh, Slovenia and uh, North Macedonia live uh, this with. Uh, uh, Greece uh, also. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, history uh, more uh, long. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, if the mutual understanding uh, is important to uh, the, uh, improve the process, uh, because uh, we always uh, work with European Union. I mean that it's the technical and uh, I think that it's the technical and chronical problems. Uh, some of the, uh, especially the uh, Western Balkan countries, South Eastern European countries, the new uh, newest member of the uh, the newest member of the uh, European Union uh, supported the Turkey's. Uh, Turkey's uh, membership. So uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes the uh, mis misunderstandable uh, process. Of course, Turkey has a much more duty to uh, their reforms. But uh, after the 2003, Turkey uh, made a lots of uh, reforms in constitutions, in uh, lots of the different uh, the laws. Uh, but uh, the it is. Uh, so some uh, the problem uh, related with Turkey, some of the, the international area, as you know, uh, and uh, the uh, the Western Balkans history also continue. Uh, the, for example, the North Macedonian uh, waiting ten years uh, 
because of the uh, problems with the, uh, Greece and uh, after then uh, the, with the Bulgarian problems. So uh, once uh, Croatia uh, also uh, waited uh, in, uh, sometimes for the Slovenian bloc. So uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, European Union's rules uh, should be the uh, uh, should be the same for all the member, uh, all the candidates, because sometimes uh, European Union use different uh, implication for the different. Uh, candidates. Uh, this is necessary. Uh, for example, mutual uh, uh, bilateral problems uh, is not uh, um, uh, shouldn't be the uh, problem of the European Union candidates. Uh, for example, it must uh, choose. It must solve. The mutual, for example, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey and Greeks, uh, the bilateral problems uh, should solve uh, mutual with uh, maybe necessary negotiations. But this is not the problem; uh, shouldn't be the problem of the European Union because sure. European Union's. Uh, uh, the, the human rights, the economically, there is a lot of uh, how can I say? There is an important uh, necessary to reforms. The reforms is important. If one uh, country, uh, for example, North Macedonia, uh, can uh, can do uh, can do the capability to the uh, the reforms of uh, European Union, uh, what European Union required. Uh, it's continued to uh, negotiations, but as you know that uh, our uh, we we opened the negotiation, but it's stopped from long time before the veto veto uh, cards for uh, Greek and uh, North uh, uh, North, North uh, Southern uh, Cyprus. Uh, so uh, because of this, uh, sometimes. Uh, and also, uh, European Union, I think, has a uh, s structural uh, some problems. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the candidates uh, uh, shouldn't be the uh, lost to their motivation. If they lost, uh, if they don't, uh, if if they don't uh, lost most motivation, they work uh, with the neighbors with the Western Balkan countries, with Europe, uh, work together. Uh, so uh, European Union couldn't lost uh, the uh, motivation for the uh, candidates. And uh, I hope uh, that's right, uh, the others for the politicians. Uh, and second, I think the uh, use uh, soft power uh, for the uh, for uh, human rights uh, on the uh, region. Uh, Yes, uh, this is important. Uh, the human rights, uh, very, very uh, important uh, problem. But uh, unfortunately, because of the history of the uh, Western Balkan uh, war, ethnic cleansing, uh, they lived in there. The uh, person uh, can't believe. Uh, not not all of them is uh, half of them, for example. Uh, some of them is can't uh, ready to live together. Uh, in the same area. This is very important, I think. This kind of human rights projects is very important for the region. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the size of the, in the past, they were, uh, the Bosnian and Serbian side, uh, Croatian uh, side uh, bo bo in Bosnia, and also Albanian type, Serbian side, uh, they should be uh, leave it, they should be ready to live together because uh, for this <coughs> European Union maybe it is not enough to a uh, human rights uh, projects uh, on this region uh, it is better than maybe the other the monies uh, money is of course uh, important for us to reforms to be uh, re, uh, re, uh, re, rebuild the reconstruction for process to give some uh, budget to project but human rights uh, project is better than the others 
because uh, money uh, can come but uh, the people should uh, live uh, should uh, should want to live uh, together they uh, want to ready to live uh, together uh, in my opinion thank you very much for your extensive answer we also have a question via zoom from professor galita shrili from georgia yes thank you are you here okay see we can hear you uh, as i remember uh, at the beginning when the negotiation started with uh, turkey from the side of european union uh, president erdogan was eager to make all reforms all changes what needed for for full membership uh, uh, cyprus question kurdish problems human rights questions etc but after uh, president sarkozy in 2005 uh, unilaterally we can say stopped this process because he was against turkish membership and he offered some alternative uh, projects but turkey did not want uh, to participate in these alternative uh, versions and president erdogan lost any uh, uh, any uh, desire or motivation to make uh, reforms because uh, it was uh, uh, there was uh, no perspective for uh, membership and uh, my question is if tomorrow a new european leaders especially in france will be ready to start everything again would be in your opinion uh, turkish government also ready to make changes for full membership or it is already uh, passed and uh, turkey has no such interest anymore thank you thank you mr uh, uh, yes uh, sometimes uh, i know uh, the uh, france uh, leadership uh, sometimes uh, the other uh, old uh, member of the uh, uh, member of the EU uh, advised the different kind of a uh, different model for Turkey I also mentioned about you uh, before uh, I said that uh, we are the uh, Turkey uh, was the oldest uh, membership of Turkey uh, we changed the different kind of uh, government uh, some of them is the uh, right side, some of them is the uh, red side, some of them is center. All, all uh, main uh, goal for, uh, for, for Turkish uh, foreign policy is to full membership of European Union. Uh, of course, you said that uh, some, uh, the, some politicians, uh, some uh, leaders, uh, rhetorics uh, about Turkey uh, lost uh, lost the uh, motivation so uh, the uh, leadership of Turkey uh, try to uh, need to uh, need to feel to answer them uh, we can uh, change our uh, road like this but uh, the official uh, times uh, some, uh, some of them is I think this is the emotional uh, emotional uh, uh, how can I say reaction emotional reaction so uh, the all uh, every time uh, the foreign ministry of uh, Turkey uh, the uh, leadership of Turkey uh, always uh, believe that our road in the uh, European Union because we always live together uh, from the long time in uh, Turkish application uh, 1964 so it is the oldest uh, member so uh, sometimes uh, for for uh, for uh, for example in uh, france you know some lobbies uh, some lobbies affected uh, uh, the uh, especially uh, uh, election times uh, affected the uh, leadership's uh, rhetoric uh, of course uh, so uh, i believe that uh, turkey it, I, I think that uh, i i know that uh, Turkey has no any other uh, any other kind of uh, plan. The different kind of uh, European Union 
alternative. alternative yes different kind of alternative for example uh, the uh, f- first uh, they sometimes uh, they um, supported some leadership uh, one kind of European Union members, uh, different kind of European Union members. It is impossible. Maybe the next years uh, we can't, don't know. Maybe European Union structure can be changed. We don't know. They have some plans about this. But uh, from Turkish side, readiness is definitely so. We can say yes. Yes, yes. We 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 are we are always want to continue. Uh, we don't want to any other alternative. I we see. always Thank because you. because uh, you know that. Or uh, all projects, we are continue to reforms. We didn't stop the reforms. Maybe sometimes changing the uh, security inside in Turkey uh, can uh, slowly the reforms. Well, but all sides of the uh, all sides, uh, cultural, economic, we are continue to uh, finish the reforms. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are actually over the time, uh, Feder? Okay. If, sure? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, dear Pina, uh, thank you for this uh, great lecture. Thank you for this amazing discussion. Uh, thank you to explain the role of Turkey in contemporary society. Uh, we spoke only about Turkey role in the Western Balkan and actually the Balkan Peninsula. But in reality, uh, Turkish position and Turkey uh, role in contemporary global society is very important and I hope next time we will speak about it uh, because uh, that everything what Turkey is doing in the moment in the supporting peace through the diplomatic methods uh, between Ukraine and Russia is very important not only for the, this small region, it is actually important for the global world. Thank you, Turkey. Thank you, Pinar, to you. Uh, and thank you once again for this great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, please. Pinar? Please stop sharing your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Exit. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine. But it's beautiful. It's okay. Yes. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Uh, and now we have a um, next speaker with us, and I'm very glad to welcome to our conference, our peace conference, uh, Dr. Martina Plantak. Uh, PhD from Androshi University in Budapest. Uh, Martina Plantak received a lot of awards and scholarships. Uh, she published a lot of uh, academic uh, articles in different academic journals. Uh, she will talk today on the role of music in promotion of peace. Uh, Martina, floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, so greetings from Stani Pelisat. I really wanted to come to visit you here to be in person there in Dubrovnik, but due to some technical problems, I was not able. So hopefully I will see you all next year. And now let me just start with my presentation. Just a moment, please. Okay. Just a second. Mm-hmm. Can you see it all, I hope? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. So the topic of my uh, presentation today is the role of music in promotion of peace, or probably better to say in peace education. So I have decided to write about this issue because also in my research, I am one part of my research is connected with the role of music and political science, probably better to say the role of music and everyday nationhood and everyday nationalism. Uh, so today I have decided to write about the role of music as a part of peace education as for example i find it quite interesting here in croatia croatia was always an emigration country never an immigration but now due to the lack of workforce a lot of people from other parts of of the world for example from philippines nepal vietnam or india are coming to work and to live in croatia 
and especially to the northern part of Croatia, which is industrially also the most one of the most developed parts of Croatia, where I also live. So today, one can really see a lot of people from different parts of the world living there, working there, starting families there, bringing their wives there, which means that in a couple of years, a lot of these children, these kids will also uh, attend grammar school, primary schools here in Croatia, in the northern part, which is primarily quite a, when it comes to ethnical backgrounds, quite a homogeneous part of Croatia, meaning that these schools will appear to be multi-ethnic schools. And I just wanted to see how this music, this musical education can help in resolving some issues, some cultural, religious barriers. So for this reason, let me just start. Let me just start to say that music is a medium that brings like-minded individuals together. And music not only symbolizes the spirit of a group, but it can also arouse national and also nationalistic impulses. What is important here to say is that music can speak to different people, different groups, and allow them not just to listen, but also to be heard. It's important also to emphasize that music has always played an important part in forming of identities, both of individuals and also of groups of people. It provides a means of defining oneself as an individual belonging to a group and of defining others as belonging to other groups which are separate from our own. Of course, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that music in some instance fix to alleviate all the difficulties when it comes to spoken dialogue or some cultural barriers. But in my opinion, yeah, we can just say that music is maybe not a crucial factor in the field building process, but it can be this first step, you know, to changing some things due to accepting someone who is culturally different, who is religiously different, and can surely also have a significant role in bringing individuals or also groups closer. For this reason, it's probably also important just in a couple of sentences to explain what is peace education. And here, it's also important to say that this peace education, or in this way, a musical education, is a remedial measure to protect children from falling into ways of violence in society. Meaning that learning for peace really deals with learning the skills, the values, the attitudes in order to create and to sustain peace. And here one can also speak about this culture of peace, which cannot be achieved without education of citizens on the skills, how to resolve conflicts constructively, how to know how to live together with each other, even though they are culturally or religiously different, how to appreciate this ethnic and cultural diversity. And for this reason, I think that music can be really good to me and really good to propagate this peace in the social and educational community by teaching young people, for example, some sort of songs that border on peace and harmony, on law and order, because these songs can also be in some form of school anthems, national anthems, folk songs, art songs, even sacred songs or popular songs. Uh, and for this reason, one can conclude that music education does promote peace culture because it instills in students the, the habit of mind, of mind that lasts a lifetime, this critical analysis skills and ability to deal with something different, to solve some kind of problems, and also for them to drive for excellence. Meaning that music education can help in preventing these disruptive conflicts in, for example, this multi-ethnic school. And for this reason, for example, experiences from many countries point to this positive role, uh, role of music activities and especially improvisational and sample practice uh, for social integration, also for conflict transformation. As for example, here we can see an example from Norway. So there was a three year cooperative research project called Resonant Community from 1999 to 1992 in 18 different Oslo primary schools. And this demonstrated uh, the positive effects of intercultural music activities in building these sort of bridges and preventing disruptive yeah. conflict in this multi-ethnic school community. Uh, and these music activities were intended to provide uh, a getaway, we can say a getaway for fostering cultural, religious and social understanding in some broader sense. So to, to explore the causes of conflicts and seeking a way to dialogue across some sort of curricular and subject divided. Also example, maybe not from school, but also Israel and Palestine. So their musicians performed together in a concert in 1999, one, nine, sorry, and this concert turned into a regular program called the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, 
where Israeli artists perform and learn with musicians from different Middle Eastern nations, while also fostering this the exchange of knowledge and understanding between people from historically antagonistic cultures. And also here from the former Yugoslavia, also during the dissolution of Yugoslavia, a couple of uh, rock bands from former Yugoslav states also decided to propagate peace by having a concert, driving on trucks, uh, giving people uh, some sort of badges, t-shirts and similar with a slogan and also the song called Mir Brate Mir, or in English, Peace Brother Peace. And with this anti-war lyrics, they invited the general public to, to commit against the war in Yugoslavia. It was quite popular back then. They also had a second concert called SOS Peace or Do Not Count On Us. So one can really here see the role that music has in some sort of propagating peace, peace education. And for example, here are a couple of ideas for this music education curriculum. The example mm -hmm. is from Nigeria. Unfortunately, I was not able to find something about Croatia, but ideas can be maybe transferred also to some European states. Like for example, listening to recorded music of other ethnic groups or singing and analyzing music from other ethnic communities, learn to play challenging musical instruments and also dance. Dance is always important, especially for the kids, for the younger people. So dance different steps from various ethnic areas or also learn these musical elements from composed music. And with this, I would just like to conclude and I would just like to say that uh, well, music has always played an important part in forming the identities of individuals and also of the groups. Uh, and it's important to, to say that it takes new ways of thinking that provide this nonviolent solutions to conflict resolution to create this culture of peace. And for this, re this reason, this peace education, or probably better to say music education, is helpful because it can prevent kids from becoming exposed to this social violence. And also, it promotes the use of active, nonviolent, different sources and techniques, and the ability to think creatively in order to resolve issues without resorting to violence. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's working. Okay, now it's working. Thank you, Dr. Plantak, very much for your really interesting presentation. We have around 12 minutes for discussion, so if there are any questions or comments from our participants, um, I ask them to... Oh. oh, just then as an introductory question, um, do you have any... Um, do you have any information um, or insight into is the, for instance, Croatian government or Ministry of Education at, at least thinking about uh, the fact that now we have we have become an immigration country and that we need to do exactly the things that you're proposing, for instance, in, in music and then generally peace and civic education. And second, connected to this, are there any examples from perhaps our immediate region or even further where this has been done and what's the success of this? Is it really, I mean, it seems like something that you would say, okay, this could really work. Do you have any examples of where it was done and, and what was the reaction of, of students, of children, of everyone um, having this kind of education? Thank you very much for a question. So the uh, first thing is I have just started with this research, so I still do not have all the necessary information to tell a bit more about this issue, but I'm researching it. so. In a couple of weeks, months, probably it will be easier for me to say some things. Uh, secondly, when it comes to our region, uh, I'm not so sure what to tell you here because I have just uh, some information about Slovenia, but uh, because I was also in my uh, doctoral dissertation researching Slovenia, also the role that music has. Uh, but I haven't seen anything. So in Slovenia, for example, the kids in school, mostly in primary schools and grammar schools, they learn, when it comes to music education, learn some, well, let's say songs uh, about uh, Hungar Hungarian music or Italian music. But that is due to the reason that they're both the national minorities. 
in Slovenia, but when it comes to some other ethnic minorities, I haven't found any information, unfortunately, if they're also able to express their culture through music, music education. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Bando is here. So uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I know your work and I know that you are deep in the cultural aspect of uh, promotion of peace, actually the cultural aspect of uh, national identity. Uh, allow me actually to, uh, to ask you, when we are talking about music, uh, what is the role of, of tuba folk in the Balkan region? Uh, you know, somehow, um, uh, if you ask some parts of elites, probably they thinking that is the dividing society and that is actually a negative aspect, but somehow, if you are talking to the younger generation, somehow they actually um, it's unification because uh, maybe not anymore so today, but a couple of years back, uh, that was a long period that Turbo Folk was almost in all disco clubs, or actually clubs, the name of disco clubs. We don't have any more disco clubs. But uh, in the uh, clubs in the former Yugoslavia, from Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, everywhere it was possible to hear Turbo Folk. And that Turbo Folk is actually for the other people. Uh, only to explain they are not from this region, this is the music actually from uh, Serbia and uh, from Bulgaria, uh, but it was in the full region. Uh, what do you think? What is the influence of the Turbo folk on the promotion of peace and what is uh, uh, probably, you know, the, the, the words of those musics? Thank you for the question. So I'm, I'm also researching Turbo folk because, because I find it quite interesting that something that was well, I would not say a couple of years ago, but like a couple of decades ago, something that was really culturally dividing the nations of former Yugoslavia, especially bearing in mind that Turbo Folk was used as Milosevic's prop propaganda machinery back then in the 90s in Serbia, is currently something that is connecting, well, at least younger people, because you can really see the influence of Turbo Folk so as i like to say so where the politics was not able to do something uh, official or the where also the economy was not able so the turbo was probably the only the only how can I say it like yugoslav product or serbian product that uh, really went uh, across the borders and is currently spreading to the whole former yugoslavia you can really from slovenia to probably macedonia i assume you can really uh, see people listening to that sort of music so it doesn't have this political connotation anymore turbo folk really pretty much became apolitical which i found which i find quite interesting uh for the a lot of researches especially for the nationalism and everyday nationhood which can also be connected with the promotion of peace for example probably a question as banal as it sounds but can turbo folk maybe be used as some sort of a source of promotion of peace? Can we really talk about turbo folk as a way of connecting all these former Yugoslav nations uh, in some sort of peace promotion? I know how ridiculous this may sound, but I find it quite, quite interesting to see because so many people are currently listening to this type of music, especially the younger ones who weren't, who still weren't born during the war and who are not connecting this musical direction with politics, with nationalism, with patriotism, even if you want. So this can surely be a good research, especially connected with the promotion of peace. I hope I have answered your question. If not, maybe I can explain it a bit better or something. Maybe we can this Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk, Thomas, and for highlighting the importance of music. I have one question. How much do you tackle the issue of inclusivity in your research, especially since you refer to the African countries? And you know, for example, in some African countries, only males can play drums, and then if you use this music more to promote the peace, maybe you can even exacerbate some problems and some issues. So did you maybe tackle and consider these issues in your research? Thank you. I'm really sorry. I think the connection was lost or something. I was not able to hear the first part uh, of your speech, of your question. Maybe if you can just repeat it. Yeah, I can, I can repeat. Do you hear me now? Can you hear me? I can now. Yes, I can. I will try to be louder. So uh, 
I, my question was in terms of uh, how much do you tackle the issue of inclusivity in, in your research, and especially since you mentioned an African country, and you probably draw on some literature from African countries, and there, for example, uh, some instruments can be only played by one gender, for example, drums in some African countries can be only played by men. So if you maybe promote uh, this type of music, uh, do you maybe take into account that this can also maybe exacerbate the issue and promote even uh, some further problems? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm still not sure if I understood everything well because the connection is here, the Wi-Fi in the hotel where I am is really bad, but if I understood it, so uh, uh, the question was how much if uh, some musical instrument can help in promotion of peace. I'm really sorry, I'm really, the connection is really, really bad. Now, can you can you hear us? Can you hear me better now? A bit, a bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, do, I'll, I'll try to interpret the, the question that we had, uh, my amigo Coleman from Zagreb University, I'm sort of, sort of moderating. Um, I'll try to reinterpret the question, maybe you can hear it better. So the question was, how much do you tackle the issue of inclusivity in your research, considering that you mentioned uh, African countries and that, in, for instance, in some African countries only the male can play the drums or some other instruments and the uh, uh, Dr. Mestrovich who asked the question was, was wondering if this may then cause um, another set of potential problems in promotion of peace and the ideas that we are talking about. It. Oh, thank you for the question. I think I now can understand it, of course. Uh, so, well, it's a different cultural background. So also one needs to have in mind, one needs to make a consideration how it can be in Europe and especially with us, with the uh, people coming from different parts of the world, as I already said, Philippines, Vietnam, Nepal, and other uh, parts of the world currently to this uh, northern part of Croatia. So one can also uh, research what type of music do they have in their folklore, their ethnicity, also what kind of musical instruments. So of course, when it comes to Africa, African states, also the drums, I think that the context, cultural context is quite different than it is here. But as I said, I still need to make a bit of research. It's still in the beginning. Thank you very much for your answer. We have another question here. Hi, um, good morning. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I have a question um, because um, yeah, so I don't know exactly how to express this, but music is not always music. I mean, I, I think through the, through, I mean, what I have understood from your presentation is really like using music for peace, which means that um, we or the participants, they, they get to know the music from other places and then uh, they, they, they communicate or they meet or they, they I mean, music is an instrument. Um, for, um, I have seen several projects on, on peace through music, and I can remember one um, in in um, in um, in Ramallah in, in in Palestine, where um, there is a music school. This is the Barenboim Said Music School. This is a, um, a, a foundation that was more, was made was created by Daniel Barenboim, that is an Israeli and Edward Said, that is a, a, a Palestinian intellectual, and what they are um, doing there is they are promoting um, classical music, Western classical music, and Western classical instruments that are actually quite far away from the culture of the participants. And um, this, is, this is good because some of them, they are really trying to make a career in, in, in this um, in, in, in music and they can go to Europe and they can advance in their uh, future career because they are very talented in, in other places, in Vienna, or, but I am not sure, they, they, they call it actually like, like, a, like a peace program through music, but I'm, I'm not sure if, if this is like this because actually um, the, we are using music that is abs and instruments that are absolutely alien to their cultural heritage, to their to the, to the, the, the cultural instruments, to the traditional music. So I don't know what's your opinion on, on this kind of project and if you would consider this also like a peace promotion or if it's just, you know, like a regular music 
um, training, a school musical career, or what have you. Um, because it is really sold and it is paid through a corporation funds. So it's like a piece, actually. Well, thank you for your question. Again, I really have some problems with Wi-Fi, so I was not able to hear a couple of sentences, but I will try and just, you don't have to repeat it again to give some answer to this uh, to this question. So, well, I think that every type of music is, is when it's uh, trying to promote some kind of peace, of course, in a positive way, you have negative peace, you have positive peace, then of course, it can be a mean for a promotion of some sort of peace. So maybe I, I do not know some popular music to do concerts it doesn't have to be always some folklore music some uh music with let's say ethical background just the sort some music is trying to promote peace to to show some diversity or even some western values it, it shouldn't be taken as something negative as when you still have something positive it is and when you really want to promote the peace uh, i'm really sorry i'm not sure if I I really understood the question so well. As I said, the connection is quite bad, but hopefully I was able to answer it correctly. If not, you can always uh, tell, ask me something more. I will try to understand it here through through headphones. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you once again for this great lecture and thank you for this amazing discussion. Uh, this is a very important topic, uh, the importance of music, the importance of culture. Uh, sometimes we don't see, we don't understand, but if we really want to promote peace, if we really want to advocate peace, we need to understand much better the culture. Thank you for your approach, thank you for this presentation, thank you to be with us, thank you. Thank you so much really for this opportunity. I'm really sorry. I really have a bad Wi-Fi here in the hotel. Hopefully next year I will be in person there so it will be easier. I wish you all the best and see you next year. Bye. Hey, thank you. Thank you. No, no. Now we have free time for wait two seconds. Did I have something wrong? No, no, no. it's not wrong. So. Uh